Stayallday.com. You're now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative. What is that? That is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of wait for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques all underneath the umbrella of one unifying philosophy that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is, we are on part, I believe this is part three, if I'm correct, or part four, part four of five. We are talking about the drivers of fear. What are the things that actually create fear in people? Why do these things happen? And what can you do as a salesperson? So I'm speaking about this from the angle of the marketer and the salesperson. What can you do as a marketer and a salesperson to address these issues? Because if you don't address them, you will not make sales. So since I've already given you the background on all of this, uh, actually, before I do that, let me give you a couple, couple housekeeping, housekeeping points. First of all, Daily motivation text. That is a text message that I send out for free every single morning to everybody in my text community. There's a message that is guaranteed to have you focused, sharp, and on point to start your day. You want to receive this message. So let me just skip the asking you the question if you want to get it and tell you how to get it. All you got to do is text me at my number, which is 305-384-6894. And every day when the daily motivation text comes out, because you're a member of my text community, you'll be getting that message straight to your phone free of charge. Secondly, work on your game university. That is where I do all my coaching. That's the only place I do coaching. That's where I offer all my courses is the only place you get access to my courses. Go to workingyourgameuniversity.com. All my high level trainings, frameworks, coaching courses, all of that exists in the university. They do not exist anywhere else. You can't get them on the open market anywhere but inside the university. So the link to the university and the number to get my daily motivation text, both down below in the description to this video. Now, getting into today's episode, I've already given you the background on this a couple episodes back, three episodes ago. This is a five part series here. So I don't have to give you too much more. Let's get right into it. Picking up on point number 10, the drivers of fear. What are the things that actually make people fearful that are controlling their actions, underlying drivers of fear, and what can you do about them? That's the most important part. Not just what the fears are, but why and what you can do about them. So let's get to it. Number 10, fear of losing autonomy. And autonomy is simply your right to self-government. That's what autonomy is. In other words, your freedom, your freedom to move about as you wish. Sometimes people do not take action because they don't want to lose that autonomy. So what does that mean? So since autonomy is your right to do as you wish and think as you wish and move about as you wish, you can lose your autonomy, for example. I'll give you an example of this. Let's say you're an older person and your hearing is starting to go. You're starting to lose your ability to hear or you're starting to lose your ability to see. And as your hearing is going bad and your, your adult children or grandchildren notice that your hearing is getting worse, and they start to think, well, grandma or grandpa can't take care of themselves anymore because they can't hear. So you know what? They, they might start to think they might need to put you in a nursing home because you can't hear or you can't see or you can't drive or whatever the situation is. Right. But if you were to get this magical hearing aid device and put it in your ear, now you can hear much better. Now your adult children won't worry that you can't take care of yourself anymore and you can continue to have your autonomy and continue to live on your own. That is an example of where the fear of autonomy could be used in order to sell something. And there's a company back in the day called Miracle Ear and they used the pitch just like that. Now they use the pitch just like that to sell hearing aids to older people that if you can't hear and your kids start to think they need to put you in a nursing home, uh, you better fix that issue of your ability to hear. Otherwise, they're going to ship you off to that home and you don't want to go to that home. So this is also in some ways this is the pitch used to entice some of you to go get that COVID jab a couple of years ago, because if you didn't get the jab, what did it mean? You will lose your job or you can't go to school, which might mean you losing your income or and that would mean losing your ability to take care of yourself. So if you pay attention and read in between the lines, folks, many of these fears are used every single day in our lives to move you to action. You just have to start noticing them. Another example of this is, let's say you go to the doctor. And you haven't been taking care of yourself health wise for several decades. And the doctor says to you, listen, um, that heart attack scare that you just had is going to be a full fledged heart attack. And you may have a stroke and you might not make it to see your grandkids grow up if you don't do something about your health. If you don't do something about taking care of your health or you or you're going to be on medication forever or you might be relegated to a cane 
or you may need you may be you know assisted living for the rest of your life in other words you won't be able to go to the bathroom by yourself or think for yourself or get up out of bed or walk up and down the steps so you can't drive a car and you always got to have somebody around watching you because you won't be able to do things on your own anymore if you don't start taking care of your health because you're getting into a worse and worse state the doctor is telling you that to do what to use fear of your possible loss of autonomy over your own body to motivate you to start doing something to take care of yourself so understand that these fear of this fear of loss of autonomy or any of these fears that i'm talking about can be used for positive purposes and sometimes you need to use these because people i mean how many times have you heard me say this people are fucking lazy people are lazy we will sit there and watch ourselves do something or not do something that is hurting us and not do anything about it because we have not been properly motivated or inspired or activated to do something about it and sometimes you need to use fear to move people to action fear is a great driver of human action because otherwise people will do nothing many times point number 11 today we are talking about the drivers of fear the underlying drivers of fear what we can do about them and understanding them number 11 fear of change you all know about the law of inertia as we talk about many times here with states you, an object will remain in motion or not in motion until unless acted upon by an outside force Many people don't change simply because they are too lazy to change. That's the law of inertia right there. And there's also sometimes people are afraid of changing. So it's better to just stay where they are instead of doing something different, even when they know that the change is the exact thing that they need to get out of the situation that they don't want. So the fear of change, this is like the person who tells you that they are stuck in their ways. Any of you ever use that phrase? I'm stuck in my ways or say that to yourself. I'm just stuck in my ways or a person tells you that. And they use that as a justification for not doing something different even though it logically makes sense that they should do something different. And the person who is attempting to persuade them to do something different knows they need to do something different. The person hearing it knows they need to do something different, but they still won't do it because their fear of change. Their fear of change is stronger than a desire to actually get whatever is on the other side of that change. And why is this? How is this possible? How is it possible that you know you need to do something different in order to make a better, make an improvement in your life, but you still won't do it because you're you're just afraid of whatever might happen, what might be on the other side of it. Here's the reason why this happens. Keep in mind that human beings are lazy and slow. People do things slowly and people are just lazy when it comes to actually doing anything, period. When they finally do do something, they do it slowly. Mentally lazy, slow to change. That describes most human beings. And if a human being can put off change forever until they die, they will do it. Unless someone, like a salesperson, comes along and helps them do something different. And understand a salesperson does not necessarily mean exchanging for money. Sales just means influencing and persuading people. That's what sales is. The fear of change is manifested in the fact that people are slow to do things different even when they know they need to do something different. I mean, if you are in a situation right now in your life where you know there's some things you need to do different, but you are taking your precious time actually doing them. I mean, you got something you know you need to do right now today, but you're not doing it. Even though you could be doing it right now at this moment, but you're not doing it because you are procrastinating and just not doing it. This is the human, this is the human condition. All right? We are slow and lazy. People are slow to do things differently even when they know they need to. So let's say if I was to have, let's say $1,000. So every time a person told me that they needed to do something, like I need to do this, yet they gave me a bunch of reasons why they were not going to do it after they just told me that they needed to do it, I would have a lot of thousands of dollars. So I've had $1,000 every time somebody told me. People not changing is not because they are unaware of the change that needs to happen. It's because they are afraid of the change that needs to happen. That's the main reason people don't change, not because they don't know that they need to do something. Most of the time, when I'm talking to someone who needs to make a change, they are very much aware that the change is in order. They know they need to do it. They just don't want to do it. They're afraid of what's on the other side of that change. They're afraid of the change, of getting out of their inertia, of breaking through that inertia. People are very aware of it. Again, they're just averse to it. They're just pushing away from anything that's going to push them out of their comfort zone. But we all understand the paradox of that is that getting out of your comfort zone is the exact, is the exact formula for actually making change in your life. So you've got to be willing to do something that pushes you out of uh, what you've been doing up to this point. So that's the paradox. And when you can break through that, this is where uh, the motivation, this is where uh, the mindset, this is where having somebody who can light a fire under you plays a role and has value because they can get you to do something that you otherwise were not going to do because you were too slow to do it on your own. So you can use the energy of another person to move you to action. All right. This is the reason why I have a, I have a 
daily motivation text. The reason why on YouTube we do the daily motivation videos is the reason why you have motivational speakers. Because in that moment when you have somebody hot and bothered and excited, you can move them to do something that if they are not in that state, they probably wouldn't do anything. So there is value to that stuff, even though it does not last. It's not a long term effect. It can last. It can be effective enough to move somebody to action, at least in the short term, at least in the moment. So there is value to that. Point number 12. We are talking today about the underlying drivers of fear. What causes people to be scared and fear as a general rule usually slows people down and causes delay. It does not speed people up and move them to action. It usually slows them down as a general rule. But there are times fear can be used to move people to action, as I just explained. Number 12, fear of bringing shame on yourself or your family. This is a big one. Fear of bringing shame on yourself or your family. So this fear is the fear that causes people to either do something or not do something because they don't want to make themselves look bad or they don't want to make people who they know, like, and trust or people who know, like, and trust them, they don't want to make those people look bad. So this is connected to the fear of criticism because many people connect criticism to shame. Now, those are not, they are not the same thing, and I'll explain in a second. And specifically, the people who connect criticism and shame together, they conflate these are usually people who have a very hard time taking criticism, people who have thin skin, as we like to say. These people who don't deal very well mentally or emotionally with being attacked by others, especially publicly. These are the people who, if you are a sports coach, for example, these are the players who, if you criticize them, you had to do it indirectly. In other words, if you want to say something to player A, what you actually do is criticize player B who can take it, but the point is gotten by player A. They know that you're kind of talking about them, but you said it to player B, because if you were to call out player A directly in front of everybody, player A couldn't take it. Player A would fall apart and collapse. So we got any sports coaches who are uh, listening to me right now. You should know as a coach which players on your team you can yell at in front of the whole team and which players on your team you probably want to take to the side. When I was an athlete, for example, I was the kind of player who could get yelled at in front of the whole team. I would get yelled at in front of everybody by the coach. But that, but I had teammates who they would make the same mistake that I made and the coach wouldn't say anything. He would yell at somebody else. And I'm looking at like, wait a minute, that's not the person who messed up. That guy messed up. But he wouldn't say anything to that guy because I didn't understand it at this level back then, but I understand it at this level now. I saw many times as a player and I saw this at the, the youth level, high school level, the college level, and the professional level, where a coach made a mistake in this area right here, that this, the criticism, public criticism of a certain player, he publicly criticized the wrong player in the wrong way, and that player completely fell to pieces. I saw both at the collegiate level and the professional level, coaches berate a player publicly, and when I say publicly, I don't mean he went to the local newspaper. Publicly just means in front of everybody else, whoever everybody else is. Usually on a basketball team, everybody else means in the locker room in front of 15 other players and other coaches. I saw multiple times a coach berate a player publicly, and that player fall to pieces in front of everybody. And when I say fall to pieces, I mean tears, crying in front of everybody, adult males, because they got publicly criticized by a coach. Whereas that coach could say the same thing to another player and that player might you know, be angry or pissed off or disappointed or maybe even embarrassed, but didn't go that far. So you have to know, all of you, you have to know who are the people who you can publicly critique and get away with it. And they will be stronger because of it. Who are the players who you cannot publicly critique because uh, they're just not they're just not wired to accept that. And again, you have to know how to deal with these people. Some people you got to pull aside. Some people you can call them out in front of everybody. And again, it just depends on who they are. This is your ability to read the room, as we say. And reading the room means just understanding the space that you're in and how a certain action could be taken a certain way by one group. It can be taken a completely different way at a different time by a different group or by a different individual. That is your skill of reading the room. This is an art. It is not a science meaning there's no black and white color by numbers way to know this. You just have to be able to read people and read situations. This is a soft skill. I did a whole series on the key soft skills that you need in life. If you did not hear that series, go refer yourself to episode number 1772. It's a five part series starting with episode 1772. So there are many people who connect criticism to shame. Again, when they're criticized, they feel shame because of the criticism. And there are some people who can take criticism and it's nothing. It just rolls off of them. All right. So you got to know who you're dealing with. 
And especially depending on what you're criticizing someone over, if it's something that they hold dear to their hearts, they can have a really hard time with that. Or depending on who is doing the criticism, because if somebody who they never heard of and don't know, some troll on the Internet criticizes them, maybe it doesn't bother them. But if somebody who you, they know personally criticizes them, you get the, the exact same criticism, they can take it really to heart. So it, it depends on several factors. So, again, this is why this is a soft skill. It's not a hard skill. So you got to be able to kind of read the, the intricacies and the nuances of the of every situation with every person. And you also got to know how people perceive you because depending on how people perceive you, the way that you give criticism could come off as welcomed and uh, helpful or come off as very cold and harsh depending on your style and who you are as a person. So you need to know yourself before you know anybody else. So for example, there, let's say if somebody gets criticized over their work or their family or some big decision that they made, some people can take that criticism and turn it into shame because those things matter a lot to them, their work, their family, or a big decision that they made. But there are other people you can criticize anything about them. You criticize their entire life and they can laugh at you or they can just completely ignore you as if you didn't even say anything. It doesn't even matter. So everybody has a different mental and emotional makeup. We're all different. So as a salesperson, you have to be able to read people relatively quickly because it's not like you're going to know their whole life story. You, can, you have to read them based on the energy that they're giving you. And you can learn to use this as an offensive weapon against your prospects, not in a negative way, by showing them that doing your thing will prevent them from shame. OK, so you don't want to feel the shame of being fat in your wedding pictures. Then you better sign up for this personal training. All right. While not using this ability might lead them to be in shame. All right. You don't get in shape. Well, you don't want to look fat in your wedding pictures, do you? All right. So you see, you can help somebody with this because otherwise this person will never go to the gym. So you want to use this when you understand it. And keeping in mind, folks, that this may be some of you may be listening to this and thinking like, Dre, that sounds like sounds very manipulative that you're kind of trying to psych, you're looking at people and you're kind of quickly psychoanalyzing them, sizing them up, reading them. And then you're kind of using different things to manipulate them to take certain actions that they might not want to take or otherwise wouldn't take. And you're just trying to get your way by manipulation. I want to let you all know that this absolutely is manipulation. Yes, this is manipulation. Sales is manipulation. So any of you who has ever sold anything, you manipulated the person you sold it to. Any of you who has ever bought anything, you were manipulated by the person who sold to you. Sales is manipulation. And even if the person is a willing participant, you are still manipulating them because you are moving them to do something, maybe sooner or faster or in a way that they otherwise would not have done it to get what you want while at the same time helping them get what they want. Understand, sometimes you got to manipulate people to get them to do what you want them to do. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. How many of you ever known somebody who needed to do something, but they wouldn't do it, and you had to uh, lie, cheat, and steal to get them to do it because it actually, it actually helped them in the long run, but had you not lied, cheated, and steal, stolen to get them to do it, they would not have done it, and they would have been in a worse situation had you not manipulated them. Any of you ever been in that situation? Of course you have. So sales is manipulation and you don't need to be, it's not like you should go announce to your customer, hey, I'm about to manipulate you and sell you something, but that is what you're doing. All right, that's the game. And as customers, when we let people sell us things, we are allowing ourselves to be manipulated. We are willful participants on both sides of the table here, folks. So nobody go and uh, stand on your high horse about this because any of you who's ever influenced or persuaded a person to do anything, you manipulated them. All right, whether you want to call it that or not, that's what you did. All that said, let's recap today's class, which is we are on part four of five. And this is the underlying fears of uh, human beings, specifically when it comes to marketing and selling. Number 10, the fear of losing autonomy. This is the fear of losing control over your ability to do, say and think as you wish, which may be based on your own neglect or something that you did wrong or something that you haven't done at all. And you can use that and kind of reverse psychology on people to get them to do the thing you want them to do. For example, selling a hearing aid so you can stay out of nursing home. Number 11. Fear of change. Human beings are lazy and slow to act even when they know they need to do something, even when they decide to do something. People are just slow and lazy. This is the law of inertia. You want to move somebody to action, then you need to understand their fear is really about change. It's not about the actual thing. They agree to the thing. They just are slow to change because they're afraid of the process of changing. And you got to be able to light a fire under people's asses when necessary. And number 12, fear of bringing shame on yourself or on your family. Some people connect criticism to shame. Some people do not. Some people you criticize them and they fall to pieces. Some people, you criticize them and they can laugh at you and act like it didn't even happen. You got to be able to read the room, understand who you're talking to, understand the wiring and the psyche of the people that you're dealing with. Some people you got to talk to 
and a softer way. Some people you can get, you can unload on them and it doesn't even matter. They can shake your hand and go to lunch with you as soon as it's over. Some people you do that and you lost them for life. So you got to be able to read the room. This is a soft skill. And this is an ability you need if you are going to sell, influence, and persuade anyone in anything. Tomorrow, we're going to get into part five, the finale of this series. But before I let you go, and remind you, Daily Motivation Text is sent every single day for free. Text me to let me know you want to get that message. My number is 305-384-6894. Work on your game university. That's where all my coaching happens, all my courses. Everything high level that we have at Work on Your Game is in the university. Go to workonyourgameuniversity.com. And that's that. I'll see you in tomorrow's episode, the finale of this series. Work on your game. Dre, all.